Well, brethren and sisters, you will have noticed, of course, in this series on the Isaiah, following the uh, highlights of Isaiah, we've had us just sketch the sections, because if you go by verse by verse, well, we, we would never get through the study. It's, we just got to sketch this for you. Now, for that reason, what, what happens, you will notice, we put all the references up there on the screen. And I, I like people who hope to read their own Bible. I do like that. But it's much easier for me and for you and saves a lot of time. And time seems to be the essence with some people. So we, we try to, to do our best to get through this matter in the, in the proper manner. Now, this is a wonderful chapter. It really is. And as I say, we're just going to touch the highlights of it and the major features to try and see this theme. So what we've got to realise is this. The divisions go like this. Now you notice I've got chapter 52 and verse 6 on there. We will only just deal briefly with that because this, the reason for that is the following. There are three hearkens. You would have read that. Hearken, hearken, hearken. Verses 1 to 3, the hearkening to the called to the, the righteous, to the righteousness of faith. That's the first hearken. Second one, a warning to law keepers. If you want to keep the law, there's a warning about that. It won't get you anywhere. And then encouragement to the faithful. That's the three hearkens in this, chap in this chapter. Now there are three awakes. First awake, the work of the Redeemer. The second awake, in 70 to 23, Jerusalem under the law. And the third one, which is in chapter 52, Jerusalem under the new covenant. So there, that's how this chapter is divided up. Hearken, 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 awake, awake, awake. This is what the prophet is saying. Listen to this. Wake up. Because it's a, it's a wake up call, brothers and sisters, to all those who think they're going to get into the kingdom of God by personal merit. Well, they're not. They're going to get there because God will get them there. That's what this chapter is all about. Now, verse 1 it tells us to follow after righteousness. It's a call to the righteousness of faith. So this is your first hearken. Open your ear. Follow after righteousness. Now here's an anomaly. Here's Romans chapter 9, Paul quoting this, this section, or alluding to it, I might say. What shall we say then, he says, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to it, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to it. Why? You see, it's an anomaly. The Gentiles weren't looking for this. And they found it. The Jews spent their whole time looking for it. Couldn't find it. Paul says, why is that? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offence, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. They were looking at it the wrong way, brothers and sisters. For all their efforts, they never found it. And Paul goes through the Gentile world and they crowded into the synagogues, crowded into his presence to hear about this wonderful message. And they were not looking for it. It was brought right up to their notice. So when it talks about following after righteousness, that's what happened. The danger of self-confidence. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to God's to, to, to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, and this is a very key word, and have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God to take it as it comes. Now here's the great example of the righteousness of faith, as the, as the prophet says. Now look, in the very first verse, in the second verse here, he tells us to look unto Abraham and unto Sarah. And he calls them a rock and a pit. It's pretty obvious who's the rock, it's pretty obvious who the pit is. Abraham is the rock, of course, and Sarah is the pit. Here's Romans. This is, of course, concerning Abraham. 
Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him, and in the margin of that chapter, in your Bible, there's a reference to that word, for him, like him. I made Abraham a father like me, says God. Like him, like him who he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things that, that be not as though they were. Now, brethren and sisters, we won't turn this up, but if you read the 17th chapter of Genesis where God outlines the promise to Abraham, he says it seven times in that, in that section, this is between me and you, you and me, me and you, you and me, and so on. Seven times that is said. Abraham, this is between you and me, me and you, like him whom he believed. That's where Paul's getting that from. Covenant of circumcision. And what did that mean, brothers and sisters? Well, of course, it means the taking away of the filth of the flesh. Or you can say we could apply that in a, in a moral sense. You can, if you like. What it meant in that chapter was this. Abraham, I'm going to make you a father like me. And I want you to do something. I want you to have a, a minor operation on your body because that's not the way it's going to be done. And we know all about procreation between man and a woman. But God said, I'm not talking about that primary meaning of circumcision. Not of, it's not of men, not born of the will of the flesh, but of God. So Abraham, I want you to do that because you're going to be a father like me. And in that sense, brothers and sisters, he became a rock. And here speaking of the Almighty, Moses said, of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and has forgotten God that formed thee. So Abraham is set forth, therefore, as the father of the fable, like him whom he believed. So it's pretty clear that he is the rock in this question. What about the pit? Now this is what it says about Sarah. We'll quote this reference again later in Galatians. These things may be taken figuratively. This is from the NIV of Galatians chapter 4. For the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. That's Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother. So Sarah stands for the new Jerusalem, the mother of us all, you might say. Whereas, of course, Hagar stands for the covenant under the law. Obedience by rules doesn't get you there, brothers and sisters. So that's who Sarah is. But look at this reference. I'm 40. I waited patiently for Yahweh and he inclined unto me. He heard my cry. And he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. If Abraham represented the fatherhood of God, brothers and sisters, surely represented, Sarah represented our human origins. And we've been dug out of a horrible pit hit, but our feet are standing on a rock. And between the two of them, they were emblematic of that principle. Born of a woman, but begotten of God. That's the story of the Bible, isn't it? That's the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look unto Abraham. That's what the prophet Nick says here. Look unto Abraham. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, 
if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed believe, be. And he believed in Yahweh. And he counted it, it, what? His belief. He hadn't done anything. He believed it with all his heart and soul. God said, that's righteousness. The man hadn't done anything. He just believed it. And he counted it. He counted that to him as for righteousness. Look unto Abraham. Here's Paul's comment. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, says the Apostle, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if... That's a little word, little word of two letters. It's a massive meaning. If we believe in him who did what? Raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Can you do that? Can I do that? Can you raise the dead, brothers and sisters? who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for justification. What is that teaching us? Teaching us this, that righteousness is a human impossibility. It's a human impossibility. Because when you talk about God's righteousness, you're talking about a righteousness in which there is no blemish whatever. Now that, for human beings to achieve, is a human impossibility. I cannot raise the dead, but I stand here with you, sitting there, believing that Jesus did rise from the dead. We believe that. And God says, you believe that? I count that to you for righteousness. That's Paul's explanation of these chapters, brothers and sisters. Sarah, that bear you. Now you know this quote from Hebrews chapter 11. Look unto Abraham. She's the one that bear you. Through faith, that faith also, and these are the key words, Sarah herself. Now she was going to manipulate everything through Hagar. Abraham, you take my concubine. I don't like the idea, but there's only way out of this. There's the only way through this. We waited too long. We got to do. We have to do something about it, Abraham. We do. So she took this other woman. It caused a row in the household. Finished up having to expel that woman with her son that she'd had from Abraham out into the desert to die. That's where that ended. But in the end, brothers and sisters, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. She believed it. And she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is on the seashore innumerable. She was a wonderful person. In the end, faith won through, brothers and sisters, and by the time that end came, she was a very very old lady had no hope ever of having a child under normal circumstances. Not one bit. It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. But she now believes God is talking about me. I'm not going to manipulate this through somebody else. It's not going to come because I was clever. I've just got away. Now look at this. When God came to Abraham, brothers and sisters, to tell him about this promise, I want you to notice how the Bible's worded. This is what I love about the, about the scripture. They're beautifully worded. This is God talking to Abraham. Quickly, but just read it carefully. 
said to Abraham, Abraham, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him. And God went up from Abraham. Now I've deliberately coloured those words in for you to absorb them. This was all a matter of theory. And Abraham is talking to the man about the theory of it. But when it comes to the woman, and this is why it got Sarah that bears you. And Yahweh visited Sarah, as he had said. And Yahweh did unto Sarah, as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Now that's beautifully worded. To the man, it's a theory. To the woman, it's a reality. Now I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, the use of the term Elohim and Yahweh. And Elohim up from Abraham, and Yahweh visited Sarah. That's what, that's what I call inspiration. That whole context there is you can see inspiration shining out of that, the way it's worded. So the lesser manifestation talks to the man about the theory of it and the greater manifestation visits the woman and makes it a reality. And we've had the voice of the lesser in the Old Testament, brothers and sisters, but when Gabriel visited Mary, it was a personality clash there, not a clash, a meeting of him and that woman. And she said, be it unto me according to thy word. And I believe that she conceived there and then. I don't, can't prove that. But I believe it. When she said to Gabriel, be it unto me according to your word, that little girl was pregnant. And it became a reality. And he came representing almighty Yahweh. I am he that stands in the presence of God. We didn't find any of the angels in the Old Testament say that. It was all a matter of promise, but now it's a matter of reality. That is beautifully worded. It's just so wonderful, brothers and sisters, when you read things. Now Isaiah says in that second verse, concerning Abraham, I called him alone. Now the word in the Hebrew means as one. I blessed him and increased him. I called him as one man and I made him a multitude. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. We know that reference. We've heard that many, many times. Read it many, many times. We preach that to the stranger. I called him alone. That word, brothers and sisters, means as one. So it's, it's not a Hebrew word that says, I just called him. Hebrew word says, I called that man as one. That is, as one to represent many. He became the representative man. That's what happened in the crucifixion of Christ, wasn't it? And his resurrection. He died, brothers and sisters, to represent us. He came in this nature. He declared by his death that God was right in what was being done because he possessed that nature. He benefited from what he did. But he was doing it as one. And time and again, people come through the waters of baptism and merge into the individuality of that man and become a multitude. Don't they? That's why Isaiah 53 said, he died many deaths. It is death in the Hebrew, is in the plural. He died many deaths because he was one. He was one. He was a man that united us all in that great hope of the future. And then it says here in, in, in the, this prophecy in verse 3, 
For the Yahweh shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places. Now this is where we're doing away with all the detail because I'm just trying to catch the theme of this whole thing. But when you look at this, see it's talking about children. This is the, the woman we learned about in Isaiah 49 that did, had a, lost her children and was given another family. She didn't have any idea who their father was. She had to make bigger tents to accommodate them. Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Lift up your eyes around about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith Yahweh, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them as with a garment, and bind them on thee as a bride doeth, for thy waste and desolate places. You see, that's what Isaiah is saying. These children are going to come from the waste. The Lord shall comfort all her waste places. Her comfort. That's Israel and Sarah there. So this is what it's about. The land of thy destruction shall even be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants, and they that swallow thee up shall be far away. The children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other unfaithful Israel shall say again in thine ears, The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. You know, brothers and sisters, when Jesus had finished talking with the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4, And she had gone away and told her compatriots, come and see a man that have told me all things I ever did. She belonged to a despised race. She's some of these children that's going to fill these tents up. And when the disciples came back, the record says, and found him sitting there, and he was no longer weary, not sitting now, standing. He was no longer weary sitting in the well. And they were amazed. Where are you refreshed, Lord? He said, yes, I have. And in that... They were all been facing him and he's looking over their shoulder. And who's coming running down, running down towards you between Ebal and Gerizim? He said, lift up yourselves and look. Lift up thine eyes round about and behold these all gather themselves together. And he said, lift up your eyes and look. He would have turned around and here comes a horde of Samaritans. That's where Sarah and Abraham's children came from, brothers and sisters, from people like that. This is what this, this is all about. Now, the second hearken. A warning to the law keepers from verses 4 to 6. Now he starts off, O oh, my nation, which of course is an address to Israel, my righteousness is near. Emphasis on the word my. Brethren, Paul says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, to everyone that believeth. See, brothers and sisters, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were going about to establish their own righteousness. They were going in the wrong direction. You see, you think about it. It's so simple, really. Here's God over here. And here we are here. And he gives you a book of, of, of laws, things you've got to do and things you don't have to do. What's good and what's bad. So you, you methodically and very hard and very willingly, maybe, work your way towards God. You're going in the wrong direction. That's what Paul's saying. They're, they're going wrong. Turn around and come back. And what do you do when you come back? Well, Paul goes on to say, the aisles shall wait for me. See the point? Try to, try to get into the kingdom, brothers and sisters, by a set of rules. Give it a go. See how far you can get to that kingdom. You won't get anywhere near it. Just wait. Now Paul says in this chapter here, a law shall proceed from me and so forth. He said, he said you've got to wait for this. The isle shall wait for me, he says. He says that, of course, there in verse 5. Here they are. The islands, that's out there. 
You know, Israel's all north, south, west, east, southern west, north, south, east, west was the Mediterranean. Out there was nowhere. The Isles are going to wait for me. Look at Paul's comment. Galatians, they're out there. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are judged by the law. You've fallen from grace. Now just have a look at this. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Look at those words. And the other people, of course, were busy. Noses down over the Torah, thinking about how they can get into the kingdom of God or whatever they might have believed in those days. These people just waited. They, they, some, some of them wouldn't have even known they were waiting. But when that message went through the Gentile world, brothers and sisters, there was a lot of relieved people from all the oppressions and evils that were in that age. And they knew that was something worth waiting for. That's what the apostle is saying here. And says the prophet in, in verse 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. The heavens and earth are a symbol of Israel. What's happening? Well, the earth's going to vanish away and wax old like a garment. Well, we know where that is, don't we? It's in Hebrews 1. To the Jews, to, to the synagogue, of course, as James calls it in his epistle, that's not actually called an ecclesia until a bit later, it's, it was a synagogue. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heaven of the work of thy hands. He's quoting Isaiah. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth a garment. That's exactly, he's just quoting exactly what Isaiah said in that very context. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And this is opposite to that. That's Paul's quotation, brothers and sisters. Faith is the sixth substance of things hoped for. The third, hearken. The encouragement of faithful. In verse 7, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. Now, here's the people that know it. Righteousness. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be judged beside. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul says, I had not known covetousness except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. I didn't know that. Romans 7 opened, opened his eyes to that. He thought, perhaps as a, as a young man growing up, that it's not wrong to want what someone else has. He saw no wrong in that, but the law says that's wrong, is it? He didn't know that. See, the, the law didn't teach them these things. But now, he says, the righteousness of God without the law is made plain. It's witnessed by the law and the prophets. They're a witness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. And there's no difference. And he said this in Philippians. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus my Lord, ye that know righteousness, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, brothers and sisters, there wouldn't be a person in this hall, and I am certainly included in this, who isn't very, very ashamed of something they've done or thought. Anyone who's not guilty of that is an, is an exceptional person. They don't exist. And we're expecting a man to come before whom we're going to stand, and he's never done anything wrong and never thought anything wrong gave his everything for everybody else and he's going to count us righteous when we know full well we're not you can't get that from the law one of the most comforting scriptures I have, several of them to this effect that God will remember our sins no more brothers and sisters and I think you'd all join me and say amen silently in your heart 
But I say to you if, you, if you're not prepared to say it, I am. I hope God never reveals to you people what I think and what I've done. I mean that. That is not judo humility. It's just, it's just the facts of life, brothers and sisters. And it's a wonderful thing to think that we've come to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. That he will impute to him, to us, what he has done. And we will have no sin and we will not be shamed in public by anybody. I am very, very grateful for that. If we're not grateful for that, well, we, we don't know anything about the truth. These same people whose, in whose heart is my law. This is Isaiah 51 verse 7. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature... By nature, the things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. That doesn't mean that our human nature is obeying the law, brothers and sisters. It means that because of what they believe, they don't do something to gain merit points. To add to the list of their merit points that a certain amount of percentage will get them in the kingdom. They're not doing it for that reason. It's instinctive. It is instinctive because... They've been overcome with the love of God. And they're going to be the people that's going to say to the Lord when he says, when you visited the sick and you visited people in prison and gave the people to want, they say, where, Lord? Where did we do that? They won't know. <coughs> they won't be aware of that. Because they didn't do it by a law. It was instinctive because of the faith which was embedded in their hearts. Even though they do not have the law, they show the requirements of the law written in their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts, now accusing, now even defending them. So if their conscience can accuse them as well as defend them, then they must have done something wrong. But you see, they did, brothers and sisters, what was right, not because it was native to their flesh, but because it was instinctive to their faith. That's the NIV, of course, rendition of that verse. In whose heart is my law? Now in verse 8, we have a repetition, of course, of the failure of Israel, the moth shall eat the moth, a garment, people who don't think like that. But he says, the other, for the other class, down in verse, the end of verse 8, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Well, if my righteousness is going to be forever, well, then there's going to be generations of people who will live forever because they've got my righteousness. That's what he's saying. Now, the first awake. So we come to the first awake from verses 9 to 16. And what he tells us is this. Oh, oh Yam, arm of Yahweh, put on my strength. And here's the language of the Exodus. Awake, awake, of Yahweh. Awake as in ancient days, as in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab, that's an epithet for Egypt, and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Uh, that, that's a reference of the Exodus, brothers and sisters. Here it is. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, this is Exodus chapter 15. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Yahweh, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood up as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone, till thy people, thy people, pass over, O Yahweh, till the people pass over, which you have purchased. It was the pass over, wasn't it? It was blood on the doorposts and the lintels. That's why they got through the sea. 
They didn't get their brothers and sisters and split the sea by the shiny righteousness which they had by law. We learn from Ezekiel, brothers and sisters, we learn from Ezekiel chapter 20, that when Israel came out of Egypt, Ezekiel 20 clearly says they were steeped in idolatry. At that point, you read it, it's in Ezekiel 20. There was nothing in that nation apart from the few exceptions, of course, Moses and so forth. Apart from them, brothers and sisters, there was nothing to commend them to God. But he split that sea and they passed over. Now what should have happened when they looked back, when the sea closed on, on their enemies that had imprisoned them, should have changed their life. They should have turned right around in the opposite direction and did the right thing, not because they were coming from this side to split the water because of their excellence in knowledge in the law, but because over here of the gratitude they have towards their Heavenly Father to do what they could not do. And that was why, O oh, arm of Yahweh, put on thy strength, he says, because that's what's going to happen, brothers and sisters. And then he says in verse 16, I will put my words in thy mouth. And he's speaking there of the great prophet that would come, a prophet like unto Moses, whom we know was a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. I will raise them up among their brethren, like unto you, Moses. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Then chapter 16 goes on to say, I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hit me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hit me. You see, brother, see how that's the, the, uh, the prophet is joining up those references together, isn't he? It's a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters, you know. You think about that last reference. We know about the sharp sword. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a thought and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there anything that is not open and manifest before him. And all of a sudden the sword becomes a personality. It's him. He's like that sword. He can see right through us. He saw right through everything. And Yahweh hid him as a polished shot. Why would you polish an arrow? Because you see, there are several factors, brothers and sisters, which makes an arrow accurate. The chief one is the bow. As a child, a young man, boy of school, I made dozens of bows. Go down the paddock and you get a tree and you get a fairly straight stick, you don't get one bent because it bends too far, but you get it fairly firm but it's got spring in it and you put your knee in it and you bend it and you, you put the thread on and what do you got? You've got a bow but one end is thick and one end is thin. So when you put your arrow in, instead of the arrow going up straight, it goes up in the air like that because the thin bit bends more than the thick bit. So you've got to keep moving your arm down the thing until the arrow's straight. Now you've got that much bow above and that much bow beneath. There's no way in the world that arrow is going to go straight. That's why Hosea talked about Israel having been a deceitful bow. But here is a bow, his bow of strength. That's what the record says. His bow abode in strength. That's another record. That's Isaiah, uh, sorry, Genesis 49. Speaking about Joseph, his bow abode in strength. Who was the bow? Yahweh. Yahweh, brothers and sisters, is not like a lot of people, thick in one end and thin in the other. He's absolutely true. And he's got an arrow which is true and it's polished because there's got to be no wind resistance. So when it goes, even, a, even a, the breeze won't deviate it because it'll slip through. It's dead accurate. And this one scored a bullseye every time. That's why Psalm, the psalm speaks, doesn't it? about children of the heritage of Yahweh, they're like the arrows in a bow. They will speak for the enemies in the gate. They will speak with the enemies in the gate. Why? And what will happen? They will equip themselves well down there in public, because that's what the gate means. And when your children leave home, they're, they're gone out into the world. They're in public. They'll behave, brethren and sisters, as good as they're shot out of your door. That's why in that psalm it talks about the the little the family and the family's got his quiver, the father and mother got their quiver full of kids. 
and each one grows to adulthood, they've got to go out and represent mum and dad down in the gate. There's enemies down there. Those kids got to be sharp and straight. And this is what's happening here. This is the work of the Redeemer, brothers and sisters. Jerusalem under the law. This is for this particular section because it would take a lot to go through all of this. Here's what Isaiah says. Away stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of Yahweh the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk at the dregs of the cup of pruning and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she's brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. Thy sons have fainted. You read that very carefully and you know what you're looking at? You're looking almost like a paraphrase of Hagar and Ishmael. Awake, stand up. Take by the hand all your sons that fainted. And Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept and God heard the voice of the lad. And that's repeated in that section. He heard the voice of the lad. He heard the voice of the lad. It's a woman that's making the prayer. See, brothers and sisters, Ishmael means God had heard. God will yet hear his people, despite the fact that they've fainted in the truth. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad. Where is he? Arise! Lift the lad and hold him in your hand. For I will make him a great nation. So it's a paraphrase. It's a paraphrase, brothers and sisters. It's a warning for the law keepers, isn't it? And Hagar answers for Jerusalem that now is. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he who was of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. You know what the word means in the Greek? To speak in the market, to speak in the agora. And Jesus used that in a parable, using one of the Proverbs, actually, when people went down to chat at the marketplace. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which engendereth to bondage, has children to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free who is the mother of us all. Absolutely wonderful, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Absolutely wonderful. Do you know that when Israel came into the land, under Joshua, they conquered the land, but they didn't eradicate all the problems, did they? And then the land was divided up. And it took many years to clear out the whole land. But they didn't clear it out. And it keeps saying that Ephraim did this, but they did not destroy the Canaanites. And someone did this, and they did not do this against the people. Then others did that, and the Jebusites dwelt among them, and so on. And so the rot was setting in, wasn't it? Separation was going fast, and Israel were not alone in that land. And the city of Jerusalem was in the hand of the Jebusites until the days of David. It took a long time. It had to be a David that did it, the beloved of Yahweh. And he made Jerusalem free. And when the land was divided before David, just get your map out when you go home. You, you, you might be surprised to know this, that the city of Jerusalem was not in Judah. The eastern border of Jerusalem came down 
and the, it went on the south and went right along the valley of Hinnom. And that was Benjamin. Jerusalem was not in Judah. It was originally in the inheritance of Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And the Jebusite, whose name means trodden down, was in there in possession of which belonged to the son of God's right hand until the day of the beloved becoming king. What a parable is that? So when David, brothers and sisters, joined up Judah and Israel, he incorporated Jerusalem as his capital. It did not really belong to Judah. That's an incredible fact of the scripture. So this here, this allegory, was also seen in that, in that figure of, the, of the, the dividing of the land and where Jerusalem first, of course, fell was in Benjamin. And that brings us, of course, to the, la the third awake, very, very briefly, because this is, you see, we've just, taught, we've just seen, of course, the two women, one, a woman having children to bondage, the other woman being, a, being a representing of Jerusalem in all her beauty. And in Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 6, we have the third awake. And it's all about a bride. Awake, awake, put on thy beautiful garment. And brothers and sisters, we're going to put those garments on. We speak positively, guaranteed that we're going to be in the kingdom of God. We will. We, we're guaranteed if we're faithful. Note about that. The, that. That won't alter. God will be faithful to that part of it. We're the problem. But one thing we know, that if we remain true, if we remain true to what we believe and stand up for that and do what we can for each other in, in this ecclesia, we will be in the kingdom and we'll be the bride of Christ and we will not be make, making our own wedding dress. And if you read the apocalypse, brothers and sisters, the latter part of, of Revelation, you will read the dressmaker is Jesus Christ our Lord. And we will not have a ceremony, brothers and sisters, where the bridegroom stands on the, on the platform here and he turns to the, to the door as it's announced that his bride is coming and he steps down these steps and goes and meet her, it'll be exactly the reverse. Because it'll be the bride on the platform looking at the door, waiting for him to come in and she will run into his arms. It'll be exactly the reverse of what we do. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth where the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That's the law and jury as such. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And as I say, the apocalypse points out that those beautiful garments were made by him. Because we put on Christ, don't we? You know, it's a marvellous thing, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Won't it be a wonderful thing? You know, next time you see a wedding, you just, in your mind, turn, just turn the whole scene round about. Just turn it completely 180 degrees. You put the bride up here, standing in all her finery, and he's going to come in that door, and he's going to see her, what he has made on her. That's what, what, that's what the biblical wedding's about. The spiritual wedding. It's a show. I am so pleased with this garment. Isn't it beautiful? Her eyes will sparkle and her very eyes will tell him that. That she's thrilled. You've made a marvellous job of this cloth costume, this dress. And it is a wonderful dress, brothers and sisters. It is a wonderful dress. It covers all the murky things in our life. It'll obliterate them from memory. God won't mention them to us or to anyone evermore, forevermore. Ezekiel tells us that as other scriptures do also. Those garments are absolutely wonderful. They're not just there to cover the body, brothers and sisters. Those garments are symbolic garments. They cover everything. None of us could ever make a garment to do that. Some of the most beautiful women in the world dress lavishly as brides. They might look beautiful on the outside, 
but everybody knows that underneath is not like that. You've got the royal couple recently got married after living several years together in a single state. Wonderful. And her dress would have been beautiful because it was made by somebody that she hired. But our dress is different. It's here. That's why, brothers and sisters, lost the last slide, haven't I? That's why that last slide I have is, I won't put it on, it won't matter, but the, the, that last slide tells us the last, in Revelation 21, verse 22, even so come, Lord Jesus. Who doesn't say that? Oh, brothers and sisters, you know, I can look back on my former life as a young man of the truth even. I was very keen, having come out of the world, a new thing to me, it was just wonderful. But I couldn't honestly say, I couldn't really honestly say, like a lot of people did around me, that they longed for the coming of Christ. Yeah, I thought, yeah, I do, and I, I really, I think I do. But life was new to me. I met a lovely lot of young people. I met especially one young woman, very lovely woman, <laughs> made a big impression on me. And I don't know whether I wanted Christ to come just then. But I can tell you now, I hate for it. I just ache for that day. I really do. I ache for it. When you see what's going on, brothers and sisters, you just, you just shake your head in disbelief. You want that cleaned up and you know that in you is some of those instincts all of those instincts that cause that problem. But you still ache for him to come because you know that you didn't want to do those things willingly. You know that you bitterly regretted doing them or thinking them. And you prayed for forgiveness and you got it if that's your attitude. And he's coming with a garment. Oh, what a garment that will charge this mortal body, brothers and sisters, with vigour like we wouldn't have never dreamed of. Walking and not fainting. Running and not being weary. Soaring on these, the aerials of the heaven, brothers and sisters, like an eagle, not even flapping its wings, effortlessly soar through the sky. With a glorious vista of not only the millennium, but what lays beyond, which is a secret, a mystery, if it, can, if it could be any more beautiful than the millennium, it's worth it, isn't it? Everything is worth it. And we're going to do our utmost, brothers and sisters, to make sure that whatever we do, we must follow after righteousness. And the way you follow after it is to wait for it. It's an anomaly, isn't it? How do, you wait, how do you follow after something you're waiting for? Well, of course, it comes to you through the scriptures. It's coming your direction. You're not going to it. It's coming to you. When you open that book, you haven't decided to read the Bible because you're going to read into it what you want to believe. You go and get the book because you open it and think, well, what does God say to me? And it comes out there into you and it finishes up engraven on your heart. That's what Isaiah 51 is all about, brothers and sisters. And that's what our future is about. So let us have a, a concerted prayer from here on, that whatever you pray to your heavenly Father, never cease to ask him, please come Lord Jesus. Praying to our heavenly Father, he is there, Jesus is listening, they're one brothers and sisters, he hears all that the Father hears, and he's in charge of everything. All power in heaven and earth is given to him. He knows every movement, every thought, every intent of our heart, he knows it all. And he knows our sorrow for our failings, he knows that too. And he's bringing that garment, brothers and sisters, and I just can't wait to put it on.